This is a long reading, so uh, try to bear with me. It's from Exodus chapter 5 through 6, verse 9. And, and I want you to know there's a lot in this, and I can't give you everything. You know, the whole idea is for uh, God to illumine the word to us, and I'll proclaim it. Uh, with the ability that God gives me. But you have a responsibility yourself to tease it out and do some of the work yourself. Here's how it reads. After Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now, let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you're stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and four men in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They're lazy. That's why they're crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the men so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Then the slave drivers and the foremen went out and said to the people, this is what Pharaoh says, I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. The Israelite foremen appointed by Pharaoh's slave traders were beaten and were asked, why didn't you meet your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Then the Israelite foreman went and appealed to Pharaoh, why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That's why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You'll not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite foremen realized they were in trouble when they were told you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron. Now, I'm sure that was a happy reunion. Waiting to meet them, and they said, may the Lord you look upon you and judge you. You've made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Moses returned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble upon this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see. Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abram, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. That's El Shaddai. But by my name, the Lord, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan where they lived as aliens. Moreover, I have heard the groanings of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, 
and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you, free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abram, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they didn't listen to him because of their discouragement and cruel bondage. You would do well just to think about that and all the human stories. <coughs> That's the right stuff, Paul. There are many human stories there that if you reflect upon it, you'll see that there are many applications. But when we become Christians, we think we have a fair idea about how the Christian life should go. It's a bit like, I suppose, driving a car. You get in, you turn on the ignition, you put the car in gear, you press on the gas, and away you go. The only snag is that's not always how the Christian life works out every time. Sometimes you do all the right things, but it doesn't work out the way you thought it should. And that's how it was for Moses in the passage that we read. He goes back to Egypt. He meets up with his brother just as God told him. He met with the elders of Israel and the people just as God told him. He showed them the wonders just as God told him he should, and they believed him. Moses did everything just as God had told him. And so far, so good. And so off he goes to Pharaoh. But everything turned very sour from there. Not only did Pharaoh refuse to let the people go, because of Moses' intervention for them, he cracked down on the Hebrews, and he made the work harder than ever before. He no longer provided straw to make the bricks. He made the Israelites scar the not just the region round about, but scar, scar the territory to gather their own stubble. And I mean, it was simply an impossible demand. And to make their suffering even greater, the Egyptian overseers beat the Israelite foreman for not making the quota. And the Israelite foreman noticed that they didn't go back to uh, Moses and Aaron. They went, they bypassed them, and they went to see Pharaoh themselves. They pleaded with him. They pleaded with him, restore the status quo. And Pharaoh was merciless. He was ruthless in his response. He charged them with laziness. And he insisted that they not only continue to gather their own stubble, but that they make the same quota, the usual quota of bricks. Now, put yourself in that situation. Don't, don't think about all those years ago, you know, 1,500 years ago. Think about putting yourself in that situation in the 21st century. The foreman left Pharaoh, and as they exited the royal compound, who did they bump into? They bumped into Moses and Aaron, who were actually waiting on them, and they weren't expecting this kind of news. And to say that Moses and Aaron had lost all credibility with the people would be a massive understatement. The four men called judgment down on them and cursed them 
and, and they accused them of making their lives miserable, even more miserable than before. And it was all their fault, Moses and Aaron, the great liberators. They couldn't say anything in their defense because they knew that the condemnation was thoroughly justified and that their disastrous encounter with Pharaoh was the cause of much greater suffering for those very people that they came to save. Think about that. How could such a thing have happened, especially when Moses and Aaron were following God's instructions so faithfully? That takes quite a bit of inward, internal turmoil, doesn't it? And at the end of chapter 5, here's Moses. He's defeated. He's deflated. He's rejected by his own people. He's alone and isolated. Not a happy place. What does Moses do? He does the only thing that he can. He vents his frustration and his defeat and his pain and his own personal suffering on God. It's your fault. Why have you brought this trouble on your people? Didn't they have enough to deal with without this? Is this why you sent me? Is this the reason you brought me back to Egypt? Now listen. This is very helpful, at least to me, and I trust to you. Moses' prayer is a desperate prayer. It's spewing out his personal pain and anger and his sense of failure and defeat. But I have only one comment to make. His prayer is honest, and his prayer is accurate. His prayer is honest, and his prayer is accurate. And as Moses lay on the ground alone before God, likely wishing he had never left Midian, and thinking he was a complete and utter failure again, psychologically, think of the impact of what had happened on a real human being. Something was very painful, yes. But history will show and time will show, not that moment, as so often is the case in life. Moses was being emptied of himself. He was that proverbial falling like the ear of wheat into the ground. This was the way forward, not to defeat, but to victory, not to enslavement, but to liberation. And sometimes these things happen in our lives. When we find ourselves most angry, most frustrated, in pain, thwarted, feeling absolutely failed. And yet how often, though we wouldn't want to encounter these situations too often, yet if we look back in our own lives, we'll find very often that those are the very places where we needed to be at any given time before we could move on and become the people and do the things that God wants us to do because nothing is wasted in our lives. Everything has a positive end. Some of you will be familiar with a lady called Elizabeth Howard Elliot, and she was the wife of the late missionary to Ecuador who was one of four missionaries who were slain by a group of native warriors. And uh, Elizabeth gave this advice to would-be missionaries. And I quote her. She told them, the will of God is always different from what you expect. 
It's always bigger and ultimately infinitely more glorious than your wildest imaginings. But then she spoils it all. She said, but there will be deaths to die. There will be deaths to die. And that's about where Moses is at the end of chapter 5. And now as we move on to chapter 6, the wonder of God's forbearance and generosity toward Moses is absolutely colossal. God doesn't chastise him for his outburst of pain and anger. Instead, he reassures him. He reaffirms him and his mission. And that's the wonderful heart of God. Even when we think he's miles away, even when we think there are things that happen to us in, in our lives that are his fault, and we express our frustration, even our pain and our anger, God is there with his wonderful grace and mercy. Don't judge everything by the moment. Give things time. God lifts Moses up, and he tells him, Six things. First, God tells Moses, Pharaoh will let the people go. That's important. Because he hasn't done it yet doesn't mean that he won't do it. Now listen to me. God's ways and God's timing aren't our ways and our timing. Is there anyone here who doesn't realize that? Any believer here who didn't want things to happen ages ago and we had to wait? Some of us are still waiting. Was that the way we wanted things to work out as we look back on our lives? God's ways and timing are not our ways and timing. I can assure you when Moses first went to Pharaoh, he would have preferred him to say, okay, Mo." They can go. But that wasn't God's way or his timing. Pharaoh had lessons to learn too. And if I can just add this, just as Moses had to learn lessons as well. Second, God reminds Moses that he's still God. The same El Shaddai, the same almighty God who had revealed himself to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet God adds something very, very wonderful. Something that must have encouraged Moses greatly. Yes, he said, I'm the almighty God. I'm El, Sh El Shaddai who revealed myself to the patriarchs so long ago. But here's one difference. Here's one difference between you and them. You are the one I revealed my sacred name to at the burning bush. The name Yahweh. I am who I am. The God who was and is and will be. You can trust me. Perhaps there are people in this little group, and you need to hear those words. You can trust God. Third, God reminds Moses that he made a covenant with Abraham. And the covenant that God made was that he would make Abraham to be a, the father of a great and numerous nation, and that Abraham would inherit the land of Canaan. Now, I can't tell you exactly how many years had passed. But God assures Moses that he has not forgotten the covenant that he made and that he had heard the groaning of his people. So often when we are in pain and when we have a, a certain revelation from God, and we're, God, when are you going to do it? When are you going to stop this? When are you going to fix this? When are you going to open up something better? And time tests us. Because it doesn't happen when we think it should. And what happens isn't the way we thought it should be. Then God declares something very wonderful. In the English translation, it simply says, now you will see. 
After more than 500 years, this is the moment that God had been waiting for. This is the time for God to act in fulfillment of his word. Abram, Isaac, and Jacob would never see it. But they received the promise. And what God is telling Moses is simply this. The time for him to act in fulfillment of his word is now. There's no more word. We're going to see it happen. Now, there are many things and parallels in our lives as Christians today. You know, many people have been, as long as I've been a Christian, I've seen these guys with, you know, these placards at back and front, Sammy's board, the end is near, prepare to meet thy God. And how many people say, you know, the world is ending and Jesus is going to come. Jesus hasn't come yet. But just wait and see. Because the time when God's clock hits that hour, Jesus will come. And the promises that he has made to you and me through his word, they too will come. Not in our time. In God's time. Because God knows best. And God's best is always best for us. It's not easy. Of course it's not easy. But it's what makes God's people the people they are. Fourth, God instructs Moses that he must go back to his people and repeat the same message. Now, how would you like that assignment? You know, you told them, you know, God was going to strike them with his mighty hand and everything's going to be, you know, wonderful. Now they've got to split themselves and people have been out across the territory looking for stubble and gathering it while other people are waiting with their clay to mix it with their bricks and they're not making their quota and the Egyptian taskmasters are heavy with their whips. I mean, I've never been a slave. But I mean, slavery must have been a terrible thing to have no rights of your own. And particularly if your, your overlord or your boss was a mean, nasty boss. I mean, think of the power that he had to inflict suffering and pain. Man, what's God commanding Moses to do? It's a very difficult thing. Okay, Mo. you got to go back to the Hebrews, the Israelites, and you got to give them the same message. To go back to people whose suffering is worse than ever, suffering that they hold you responsible for. And God tells Moses he must tell them the same message that he told them before. My friends, this is very instructive. God knew something Moses and the people didn't know. Let me tell you what it was. He knew the future because he held the future in his hand. God's word is 100% reliable and unchanging. It doesn't make any difference if people accept it or not. God will do what he says he will do because he is the sovereign God who wrote history and who fulfills history. And that weighed on me as I read this particular episode because our 21st century responsibility is exactly the same as Moses. It is to take what God has taught us and tell it. God tells Moses he's going to redeem the people. He tells them how he's going to do it. And you know, it's getting harder and harder and harder today. Certainly in this part of the world, but much more difficult in other more hostile parts of the world to tell people what God has told us. Because it doesn't sit well. It doesn't suit our culture. It doesn't suit what we think, the way we think life should be. 
And that's the biggest challenge. And you can see the result of that right across the spectrum of Christendom, where you hear all kinds of messages that God never told anybody. And men and women who are Christians repel from God's truth, his whole counsel. And they don't speak it. They either mix it, they avoid it, or they make up their own. Faith God declares that he will take the Israelites as his own people. And I can't get away from it, but this is a declaration of the divine election of Israel. He has made his covenant with them. And by these words, God assured Israel of their special status. They would be his people in a way no other people up to that time had been. And this was an incentive for Moses and the Israelites to believe and act upon God's word. And essentially what God is saying here is, trust me, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. But where's the proof? God, you've said this, but I want proof. I want to know. Yes, I've got your word, but let me see something. And God says, I'm not going to give you any proof yet. I'm giving you my word. And my word is this, when you come out of Egypt and you're at the place where I will take you as my own people, then you'll be able to see, then you'll be able to look back and see that I accomplished everything I promised you. And how true this is of our lives. So many of us go through trials of different kinds and many of them can be painful and demeaning and diminishing. And sometimes we even think that God has abandoned us. We think that those set of footprints in the sand are ours because there's nobody else. And the feelings and the trauma that we go through is absolutely excruciating. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay to feel that way. But then the day comes when God shows us the proof. And we look back only then, not when we're in it, but we look back and we say, thank God, thank you, God, for bringing me through. I didn't even think you were with me. I didn't feel your presence. It was so sore. I was even doubting my faith and my trust. But God brings us through. And then we look back on our lives and our experience, and we can see clearly the hand of God bringing us through and making life better. And that holds true today. Look, it's six minutes to 12, and I'm leaving it there. I'll tell you why. Because there's cookies and goodies and coffee and tea, and we need to have some of that. God willing, there'll be more next week, and I hope you'll be here for it. But there's enough there for you to think and reflect on that Sometimes we think as Christians, everything's going to be fine and we've got it all under control. And then we hit the turbulence and it's as if God has taken his hands off the steering wheel and there we are. That happens today with me and you. But the lesson of Moses is this. God is faithful. God is true. You can trust his word. It's going to happen. It's going to be. And those of us who are brothers and sisters, do you know what? We are the sons, and we are the daughters of God. And God is our refuge and our strength and our liberator. And there's a day coming when we won't need faith because we'll be in it with God.
We'll not need faith for anything because it will all have come to fruition. We'll not need hope either because it will all be fulfilled. And then we'll discover that the greatest of all things is love. The love of God, because that's what will surround us. And that's what we'll be living in the midst of forever.